Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Good afternoon, listeners, and welcome to episode nine of the Ad Nauseam podcast. As always, my name is David Noe, and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Winkle. How are you, Jeff? Doing great. Good to be here. Excellent. So before we get started today, we want to give a shout out yes. to a loyal listener, Mr. Ben Peterson, who's listening to us from the wilds of Texas. Oh, thank you, Ben. Yes, he's Excellent. a devoted listener. We also want to uh, set up this week's episode and tease next week. So, yes. Jeff, what are we talking about today? This week, we're getting brugally. Brugally. Full on Brugally. All right. Yes. Uh, so we're talking about Peter Brugel, uh, who was a Flemish painter in the 16th century. Okay. 1550s, he kind of hit his stride. That's, that's, that's kind of the sense I get. All right. And I would say he's arguably most famous for this painting we're going to talk about today. Yes. Entitled um, uh, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. Right. A name of a painting that I think Brugel likely didn't give him it, mm-hmm. it himself. Um, one of the many mysterious things about the painting, but that's how it's known today. Right. Well, and, let's not go too deep. Okay. We've got to do some more uh, that's right. I was getting housekeeping. Too, getting too excited. Yes, yes I understand. Right. Yes. Uh, so we have an opening quote, both yes. from uh, Celsus, the uh, ancient medical doctor. Yes. He says, uh, Si sina vomitu now se avit. What, what, what does that mean? That means if someone got sick without vomiting. Can you do that? I, I don't know. You can, I've right? done it for 25 years. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The, the no vomit streak. That's right. 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 Um, and uh, before we have our kind of our big opening quote, um, yes. can we tease next week? Yes. Yeah, so next week we're going to talk about the death and burial of the Apostle Peter. Yes. And Jeff, this is a topic near and dear to your heart it and is. on which you have quite a bit of experience. Why don't you set this up for the listeners? Yeah. So it's a fascinating story. So according to tradition, Apostle Peter was martyred crucified in uh, in Rome during the Neronian, the famous Neronian persecution of the Christians. So this would have been around 66, 67 yes, AD. exactly right. Yeah, in, in Rome at the same time that likely the Apostle Paul was. The tradition says he was, he was martyred in the area of the Vatican. He was buried in that same area. And ultimately, it's his bones that reside under the high altar of St. Peter's Church in the Vatican. And so we're going to, next week, we're going to talk about that's the story of his martyrdom, and then also talk about kind of the archaeology behind mm-hmm. that. You know, is that is there any truth to that at all? Because this is a site you've visited multiple times, many times, right down into the crypt, down into the crypt um, beneath the giant church there in the Vatican, and you can make a special request, and a, usually it's a priest who will take you down there, and there's this whole necropolis down there. It's absolutely fascinating. Right, right. All right, so that's for next week. Yeah, and today Peter Bruegel the Elder, landscape with the fall of Icarus. Yes, and Jeff, you have an opening quote for us. Why don't you go ahead and read that? I do. This quote is from a gentleman by the name of Tim Smith Lang. He mainly seems to be an art historian, but very interested in the intersection between uh, classical literature and Western art. And he writes this, it is hard to overstate how little the metamorphoses, that is Ovid's metamorphoses, resembles uh, the rough poem as Ovid himself called it. On the one hand, it is astonishing for its sheer compendiousness, running ab origine mundi, Right up to the time of Julius Caesar, Ovid's epic weaves around 250 myths together into a single unbroken song. No other classical text comes close. To medieval readers, it looked like nothing less than the Bible and theology of the pagans, the master key to all their culture and knowledge. And in ways that prove vital for artists, the Metamorphoses' compendiousness encouraged scholars and translators from the 12th century onwards to create a gamut of Ovidian epitomies and expansions, from the vast Ovid Moralis, adding tales and morals to make a translation some 12 times longer than the original, to the cribbing guides and emblem books designed to fit into the 16th century pockets. The Metamorphoses was available through a wider range of surrogates than any book except the Bible. Oh, that's impressive. It is. So we said on an earlier episode... Uh, we made this claim that the influence of Homer's epics on the Greeks was similar to the way that the Bible has influenced Western culture yes. since the time of its composition. So this is a similar claim yes. uh, that Mr. Smith Lang makes here, but that Ovid has had more influence on the art and culture of the West than any other author since that time. That's right. And that kind of dovetails, I think we were talking in the previous episode about how if you are generally familiar with a, a version of a Greek or Roman myth, 
chances are the version that you're familiar with is Ovid. Absolutely. Yeah, it casts a huge shadow. So nice nice job dropping some French in there. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I probably botched it. It was very compendious. Yes, I... I <laughs> <laughs> yes, two two uh, uses of the word compendiousness yeah. uh, in there is a, a word I don't think I've ever used. It must break some law. Yes. <laughs> uh, speaking of breaking laws, yes. this episode is airing, isn't it, on a particularly interesting day in American culture and politics. It is. No, This, this episode will drop on November 3rd of this wow. year. Wow. And that is uh, election day. That's right. Yeah. A lot of people are very exercised about this. Are we uh, doing anything special here in the uh, ad nauseum in the vomitorium? No. As a kind of as a general rule, I think both you and I agreed upon that this would be an oasis. That's right. From um, political nuttery. Yes. Did you say a wasteness? I said oasis. Oasis. Yes, like the British okay. band. Okay, yeah. right. So we're staying away from that for We're going to stay part. away from that, right. Okay. Yeah, okay. So we're calling attention to this date coming up, but we're not going to we're not going to dive in both feet. Yeah, but you us. must you must have political opinions. Of course I do. We all do, right? But this seems to be uh, not the place for it. But um, I mean, you too, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have some political opinions. To really understand my politics, you'd have to read all the books I've read. Okay, and we don't have time for that. We don't have time. You've read a few. I've a heard. couple. So let's yeah. get on then to Ovid <laughs> and uh, Western art here. Yes. So or, there must be a, a couple of examples to illustrate Mr. Smith Lang's point here yeah. about Ovid being so influential. Right, exactly. So the, uh, a couple that come to mind are... A couple of the great uh, Bernini statues, oh, yes. which are now in the Villa Borghese. That's right. In Rome. Right off the, uh, you got to take a, a metro out there, right? You, you do. take the metro out, you get out, you walk. Right, it's kind of this big park. Oh, it's, it's gorgeous. Big, it's, it's wonderful, right? You walk about a quarter of a mile, if memory serves. Exactly. And emerge into this uh, open field. Sometimes there's a little carnival going on there right. with these uh, little kitty rides and concession and That's so right, forth. exactly. It's magical. But don't try to go there without a ticket. No. You get a time slot. <laughs> it's not like general entry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like my trip to the Secretary of State's office this morning, <laughs> to be honest, except the interior uh, is so much better. So you're, you're saying that visiting the Borghese is I'm just not saying, far from the DMV? <laughs> I, got a, I got a ticket. I scheduled an appointment. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Noe got me in line at the Secretary of State's office. Yeah. While there, I thought only classical thoughts. I'll yeah, tell you. Of course, as you uh, usually do. But like the, the Villa Borghese, you can't just show up. It's not like the Coliseum where you can queue up, right? Right. No, you have to have... A ticket. And uh, once when I was there not too long ago, some students were devastated because we hadn't called ahead. Oh, man. Right. Angry mob here for the Villa Borghese. Yeah. Oh, Do you my. have an appointment? No, we don't. Right. So, so in, 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 in kind of in peak times, it doesn't make for the best no. viewing experience. You're kind of hustled through. But once you get in there, oh, it's oh, just man. gorgeous. It's, it's, it's incredible. The highest concentration of, of beautiful art, I would say, you know, per square foot square meter in Europe. More than the more than the Uffizi, really. Absolutely. Because really? the Uffizi is gorgeous, but it's, it's much larger. It's huge, right. Right. The Borghese... Uh, so there's some filler in the Uffizi? Uh, like... I didn't say that. <laughs> the Borghese is just stuffed to the gills. It's true. And the two pieces that we're mentioning quickly here yeah. are the Apollo and... Daphne yes. of Bernini. Unbelievable. Yeah. I might say that's my favorite work of Bernini's kind of, they, I think most people call him post Renaissance. Yeah, Baroque. Uh, yeah, Baroque, right. Yeah, he put his stamp on Rome everywhere. Absolutely, yes. Um, but perhaps one of my favorite works of of art of all time. It's unbelievable. Yeah. The... That and the rape of Persephone. Yes. So Pluto and Persephone. Yep. So we have to devote a couple of episodes just to that. Oh, definitely. But the point we're trying to make, despite our digression, yes. Jeff. <laughs> You're putting this on me. Okay. Yeah, I'll okay. Take it. Is I'll that, take it. Uh, well, I'm the one that went to the Secretary of State's office, <laughs> That's true. so to speak. Uh, some days we don't let the line move at all. That's right. We call those uh, Tuesdays. That's right. <laughs> Uh, is that Ovid has had a profound impact on Western art. Absolutely, right. So those two statues, unimaginable without the Ovidian uh, inspiration. Exactly. And there's many other kind of paintings and uh, works of art we could mention here, but uh, we got to get down to business. All right, so let's talk a little bit about who Peter Bruegel was and, and a bit about his, his life. So like we said at the beginning, he's a Flemish painter, Dutch-Flemish painter from the uh, the 16th century. So born in, in 1525. As somewhere thereabouts. Yeah, in, about a decade after the start of the... Protestant Reformation. Yep, dies in in 1569. So both of us have outlived uh, his his lifespan. Yeah, I guess uh, that made him what about 44. Right, which maybe back in the 16th century was a, a good long life. I think so. Yeah. The, these uh, men and women accomplished great things. Yes. Uh, by the time they were in their early 20s. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unreal. Um, but part of this, what's called kind of the the Dutch Flemish or Northern Renaissance. My again, I'm not an art historian. 
and neither are you, but my sense is that Bruegel's not, he's not like the first name that comes to mind when you're talking about the, the Northern Renaissance. No, uh, I would say he's rather obscure. Obscure, like a, like a more like a Jan van Eyck would be more mm-hmm. uh, someone who would, people would more readily associate with this period. So he's not that well known. And I think if you, if you look at the bulk of his work, it's uh, he was known for uh, pastoral scenes. Jeff, what's a pastoral scene? Pastoral scene is a landscape. Okay. Fields, mountains, hills, just peasant life is uh, is what Bruegel was most famous for. So no particular action, not a scene of war, a romance, a no. domestic, something inside the house. Daily rural life. Okay. Right. Which I think in, in, in some ways makes the painting we're going to talk about that much more interesting. He was not known for mythological or even biblical paintings. He has some, he has some of that in his repertoire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for the most part, he was a landscape painter. Yeah, the famous Tower of Babel, of yes. which there are two of those. And uh, we'll throw all of this up on the show notes. A uh, new part of the Ad Nauseam website called What's on the Menu? That's the show notes. So we're going to put that up there, and you can find links to some of these. And in fact, as we discuss today's painting, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus, you really have to see it Yes. before you listen to the whole podcast. You might want to pause now and go make sure you have uh, some view of it in mind. That's right. So it, it's hard to, t- to, to simply just talk about a painting, right? So if, if you're able, have it right in front of you as you, as we, as you listen. Yeah. Mainly landscape uh, scenes. Uh, he, he dipped his toes into um, biblical subject matter, mythological subject matter, just a handful of times. Mm-hmm. Um, he seems to have had maybe some fascination with the Icarus um, uh, myth. Uh, there's, a, there's an etching in which he also uh, does a version of the Icarus myth. Uh, another uh, engraving where he, he details the myth of um, Phaethon, the, mm. uh, which is very similar to the Icarus myth, the young man. That's right. Who, who disobeys his father, takes the reign of the chariot of the sun, and yeah. madness ensues. Sometimes it's called a deadly wish motif. Yes, exactly. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Now, there's no particular wish in Daedalus and Icarus, but it's the same idea of innovating on nature and uh, having disastrous consequences. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a shade of hubris. Right. Yeah. So before we get right to the painting itself, there's, mm-hmm. there's one other really fascinating painting that I came across yeah. as I was doing my prep for this I, episode. I know, I, know, I know what you want to talk about. You know about. which one I want to talk about? <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> it's two lean men eating a fat man. Yes. It, it, it is an incredible painting. Right. It's exactly as you describe it. There's no metaphor there. It's, it's a fat guy getting eaten. Right. So this was a painting from uh, 1559. I believe it is in Copenhagen right now. And on the left-hand side, you can see a fat man. Yes. And uh, there are two lean men taking a bite out of his cheek. Uh, one has fully engaged with the cheek flesh, yes. and the other is looking on longingly. At the cheek flesh. Yes, it's grotesque. It's bizarre. It provides a good point of contrast between what Peter Bruegel is doing and the Italian Renaissance painters. Yes, absolutely. You find a lot more of that kind of the, just the weird, just kind of the, the, the oddities and the, yeah, the, the grotesque in, in, the, in the North as opposed to the Italian Renaissance paintings. Right, so... Yeah, you look at uh, paintings by Botticelli. He's the one that comes to mind first. But there are, you know, so many others, Raphael and the other greats. The characters in their landscapes look like gods and goddesses, angels. They have diaphanous clothing, perfectly symmetrical faces. They're tall, graceful. You know, your average ad nauseum listener, basically. (laughs) Exactly right. But in Peter Bruegel the Elder, the, the landscape is just clogged with peasants. Yeah, just people, just everyday people. People, people on the street, people that, that, you know, as you knew them in your, you know, down the lane, the next farm over, there's not an idealized kind of godlike quality to these right. people at all. Right. Their clothing is drab. Their hair is not kempt. Their faces are simple and plain. Uh, they're average persons. Yes. And this seems to be part of uh, Bruegel's fascination with the common and sometimes with the absurd, because there's another painting that we came across that was also really interesting, and that is Big Fish Eat Little Fish. Yes. Can you describe that a little bit, Jeff? It's, it's, well, it's, it's a very large fish. It looks it looks dead to me, right? Kind of beached, and then all of these other tiny fish kind of tumbling out of the mouth. Of and what's the, tumbling out of their mouths? Um, tell me, I didn't, more fish, more fish, and out of their mouths, more fish, more fish. It's, it's fish all the way down. <laughs> so, you know, a little fish is eaten by a bigger fish, yes. is eaten by a bigger fish, etc. And he has this landscape with this massive fish and out of it is pouring all these other fish yes it's it's, it's weird it's it's not as creepy as uh eating a fat guy no it isn't but it's it's up there yeah so uh can we find some analog you know maybe in listeners experience of the way these landscapes are packed with extraordinary detail 
I would say, um, to use a kind of example closer to, to Bruegel, uh, Hieronymus Bosch. Okay. Uh, Bruegel's often compared to. Um, a more contemporary example, I would say, like a, a Where's Waldo cartoon. Where's Waldo? Yeah. So you're looking for Waldo, but there's all these hundreds of different little dramas going on. Mm -hmm. So it, Bruegel's paintings, I think especially the one we're going to, you know, at some point get around to. <laughs> Eventually. Um, it rewards the, uh, the prolonged look. Right. And the careful viewing. Yes. Yeah, some of the scholarship I was reading says that one of these paintings of Bruegel, you can stare at it for several hours and still be discovering new details in tiny little portions of the canvas. Yeah, yeah, I like. I buy that. Yeah, I kind of liken it to um, early CGI in movies. You yeah. know, when you have the the big crowd swarming across the plane, at first all the characters look really unlifelike. So, you know, CGI of 15, 20 years ago, the characters look all very unlifelike and really similar to one another. Right. All moving in the same direction. That's right. right. And, and maybe if they had a big budget, then there would be one or two character types that they would intersperse. So if you looked at one and then you looked at a second, they'd be different. But if you looked at the third, you'd recognize the first. You yeah. With, you with yeah, me exactly. here? Exactly. Right, right. <laughs> Not to get too arithmetical. Yeah. But today's CGI is so seamless. impressive and seamless. Yeah. Each individual in the stands, for example, has different character qualities. Right. Yeah. And that's what Bruegel's like. Every little element on the canvas, unique. Yeah, that incredible attention to detail. So, so the listeners are going to want to check out uh, Two Lean Men Eating a Fat Man. Absolutely. And they're going to want to look at Tower of Babel. Yep. And uh, what was the third one? The Big Fish Eating Little Fish. Yes, Big Fish. And we'll fish. have links to these on the, uh, Absolutely. On the website. Right? Yep. Yeah. Well, let's let's get down to the main event. What okay, do you say? let's let's talk about Icarus. So, like I said, I think this this painting, my sense is the one that that um, Bruegel is most famous for. And what's really interesting, the painting itself was likely not even painted by Bruegel himself. Hmm. Likely a version of a of a Bruegel original. So, I, I think we're on solid ground in saying that the painting we're looking at is is definitely Bruegel. Esque. Bruegel esque. Br Bruegel y. Right? <laughs> uh, Jeff, that's Bruegel. That is Bruegel. Right. Yeah. I had a couple of Bruegels for breakfast. Yeah. yeah. Moving on. Yes. <laughs> so the painting we have now is a, um, what well, seems to be a copy of an original Bruegel. Okay. Um, and there's another painting of virtually the same subject, which is uh, has actually Daedalus up in the sky. Mm. Um, but that is not the most famous version and the one that gets the most attention. Um, and that one was recently discovered, right? Yeah, uh, recently in the, in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Some, the early part of the 20th century. Okay. But, That's I mean, fairly recent. But, I mean, but uh, yeah, I mean, far removed from Bruegel himself. Right. Right. Now, where is this painting housed today? It's in Brussels. Okay. In the Museum of Fine Arts there. I've um, never been to Belgium, have you? I have not been no. to Brussels. Right. But um, uh, I would say that Bruegel is, is I think we call him the third most famous Belgian export. Okay. Yes. After the waffle, of course. Oh, right. Yes. And Jean-Claude Van Damme. Van Damme. Are you, are you, are you familiar with Muscles his, from Brussels, his right? Exactly. The yeah. Muscles from Brussels. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, Bruegel's right up there. Top three. Okay. Top three, uh, Belgian. You're not being a little facetious, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. No, <laughs> the painting. Right. And, uh, I think what it makes it so interesting from a classical point of view is that it's clearly a response to Ovid. It's clear that Bruegel knows his Ovid in the way that he lays out the painting and tells the story there. Right. I agree with that. Absolutely. So this is from Metamorphoses, book eight. Yes. It's where Ovid tells the story of Daedalus and Icarus. And Icarus. Um, famous story. Yep. I'm guessing a lot of you out there listening know the story. Right. And you probably know Ovid's version. That's right. So yeah. Daedalus was the famous craftsman. He invented uh, androids or automata. Yeah. He solved some other amazing engineering problems. And as this story begins, he's trapped on the island of Crete right, in a he, labyrinth which he built. Which he built and designed, right, to house the Minotaur, right? In order to spare uh, King Minos the embarrassment yes. of having this monstrous son. Exactly right. But now Daedalus is trapped in it with his son Icarus, and he has this Sophie's Choice kind of thing. Yes. Do I stay here in the labyrinth and my son and I are safe and intact, or do I risk the air and uh, probably risk death for my son. Exactly right. And, the, and in Ovid's telling, it, it's kind of it's clear that Daedalus knows at some level that he's messing with things that he shouldn't mess with. Oh, I think absolutely he does because yes. Ovid has this brilliant line about he decides to improve nature. Uh, yes. I don't remember the exact Latin right now, but he's going to improve upon nature. And then as he's putting together the wings, right, the um, his son Icarus is standing nearby and kind of distracting him and playing with the elements of his father's craft. 
yep. chasing Make, chasing feathers around. That's right. Makes yep. me think. Makes me think the way Ovid tells a story that Ovid himself was a father. Because oh, if you've ever tried, you know, to work on some project with a very young child, no. you yeah. want them there, uh, honestly. You want them to learn. You enjoy their company, but they're really not helping a lot. No, exactly right. And you eventually what... throw the tools down and <laughs> walk away in frustration. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to win Father of the Year. Let's say that. <laughs> But that's what Daedalus does. And then so they take off, right? They're flying through the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, it's very, very successful. Right. And then everybody knows the story. Right. His father's given him, um, you know, he told him, don't fly too high. He also yeah. tells him, don't fly too low, too. Don't that's fly too low. People pick, miss that. Part. Pick the middle course. Pick the middle course. Like the, you know, Stoic or Aristotelian moderation. Exactly. Stick All things to the in middle moderation. course. Right. But of course, Icarus doesn't listen. Nope. Because he's a headstrong young man. And, and flying's fun. It is. Yeah. So I'm told. And so he goes up near the sun. The heat of the sun melts the wax wings. He plummets to his death. Exactly. Right. But while they're still up in the air, Ovid has these lines. Uh, will you read a bit of the Latin for us, David? Yeah, I'll read a couple lines. So we have here uh, line 217 from Book 8. Hos aliquis tremula dum cap tat harundina pisces, aut pastor bacolosti wa win nixus arator, widet et obstipuit qui quae thera carpera possent. Cray did it essa deos. Yes. Stop in the middle of the line there. Those last three words, cray did it essa deos. Right. Uh, let me read uh, A.S. Klein's translation. Klein's coming through for us again. Yes. Yeah. You got, um, find him online. Uh, free, great translation. He translates, some angler catching fish with a quivering rod, or a shepherd leaning on his crook, or a plowman resting on the handles of his plow saw them, perhaps, and stood there amazed, believing them to be gods, able to travel the sky. Yes. Yeah. All three of those characters are in the painting. That's right. Yeah. First of all, the angler, the fisherman. Yes. Right. With his quivering rod, his uh, tremula harundina, the shepherd on his crook. Yep. And the plowman resting on the handles of his plow. Right. They all look up. They yeah. all see him and they all draw the same conclusion. Credit it as a deus. He thinks that they are gods. are gods. Is this a good thing? It's not a good thing. Okay, tell right. us more. Um, this is, it, it's textbook hubris. Okay. Right? Um, human, uh, so we were talking about Daedalus, you know, improving upon nature. Right. Um, this is idea, human beings shouldn't fly. If the uh, gods had wanted them to fly. They would have given them wings. Exactly. Exactly right. And so they're, it's a transgression. And so to be like the gods is not a good thing. You're mm. in, you, are, you are inviting nemesis. Right. Of course, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, the punishment comes on them. Right. Um, but in the Ovidian version, all three of these guys, the fisherman, the shepherd, and the plowman, they stop what they're doing, and their jaws drop, and they're transfixed on this, this drama. So before we talk about the painting itself, the big event, we want to talk a little bit about our sponsor. Today's yes. episode is sponsored by, once again, the Moss Method the for Moss Greek. Method. What is the Moss Method? Well, it's a way for anyone to learn how to read ancient Greek. Oh, Wow. So this is a program I've put together. There are 40 lessons per module. It's designed for those who are homeschoolers. Maybe they're, you know, 14, 15 years old, and they've done a little bit of Latin. They want a great challenge. They want to study some Greek. It's designed for those who are in seminary, who are entering seminary, and they want to get a real thorough and broad exposure to the Greek language. It'll teach you how to read the New Testament also. So it appeals to all ages and, um, and levels of experience. Absolutely. I like to say I can take you from Neil neophyte to erudite oh, in a very short amount of time. I like that. That rhymes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And perhaps the most interesting aspect is that there are a number of uh, retirees, uh, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who are studying Greek with me uh, this way. That's fantastic. Yeah. They really enjoy it because after all, Greek is beautiful. It's That's a lovely right. language. Fabulous. Uh, but I have to ask how much? How much? How much? Uh, $299. Okay. And that gets you... 40 lessons, six quizzes, two exams, and a partridge in a pear tree. Wow, man. No, uh, seriously. In time for the holidays? Yeah. yeah. It gets you extended access uh, to my expertise. That so I'm great. interacting with students all the time, responding to emails, uh, Zoom calls, things like this. This is a way that you can really uh, get a, a good foot into the door of learning ancient Greek. That sounds great. Where can students find more information? They need to go to www.mossmethod.com. Mossmethod.com. Excellent. Check it out. 
We also have a big announcement. This is the pre-announcement to the announcement. All right. Um, but because of the great interest in the podcast and our numbers, we have attracted a sponsor. Awesome. And this is a sponsor who's going to help out the podcast um, and make the podcast better. Right. Um, but it also comes with a with a nice enticement for listeners as well. Yes. A yep. way for them to access some of the things we're talking about. Exactly right. That's fantastic. I yep. can't wait. Yep. Stay tuned. All right. So, Jeff, let's get back to it then. And we're going to look now at the painting itself. Yes. And see how it is that Bruegel copies some of the elements of Ovid's tale and then takes it in some strange ways as well. Exactly right. So the first thing that, um, at least the first thing that I noticed um, in looking at the painting with the, with the Ovid's version in mind is that you recognize that the fisherman and the shepherd and the plowman are also in the scene. Correct. Um, so that gives it the... The mark of authenticity. Right. This is not just any story. This is the Ovidian version. Exactly right. But even there, it would be so easy to walk past this painting and say, oh, another Bruegel-y landscape. Right. right? It's a nice, there's a nice sea scene. There's a, there's a cliff. Um, there's a city in the distance. city in the distance. He's Bruegeled it up pretty nicely. It's, it's, it's full-on Bruegeled. Um, but the only thing that uh, really lets you know that this is the story of Icarus is if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, hmm. where you see the flailing legs of the dying or dead Icarus yes, after this, he's landed in the water. This young man who might be 9, 10 years old, some artists depict him as a late adolescent, right. 16, 17. Right. Here he's just face down, submerged. He's face down. If you look really close, you can see... Um, a hand sticking up, a blurry um, mass on, on the left there. Just two uh, white flailing legs. It's two, like, two white flailing legs, right? Yeah, yeah. and the, the characters in the painting, the plowman, the fisherman, and the shepherd, their attention is not directed to Icarus. Exactly right. Completely oblivious to what's happening. Whereas Abed had them believing they were gods, uh, here they've completely missed it. Right. And so uh, that's, that's, I think that's the most um, kind of jarring reversal. Yeah. Two of them have their backs turned to the fall of Icarus. Exactly right. The fisherman probably also in the lower right hand corner. He, he's looking down at what he caught. With that's a red hat. You know, he, he's oriented in such a way in the painting that he could be looking at Icarus, but it's clear he's not. He's not. He's got his arm out. It looks like he's, he's messing with his line or something like that. Right. So they all miss it. So I think kind of the, um, the obvious question is, why? Right. Why, did, why does Bruegel invert this like that? What's, what's your take when you... Well, the most prominent aspect of the story is obviously the death of Icarus. That's, that's what it's titled. The most prominent aspect of the painting and the place where the light, you might say, is revealed, the spotlight, the center of the activity is the plowman. It's the plowman. That's which what your is, eye is drawn to. Exactly, because it's right in the center. If an individual did not know the story of Daedalus and Icarus, as you said, I'll restate it in a different way, and they looked at this painting, they would think this is just a nice landscape, and Bruegel's really interested in farmers. In farmers, exactly right. So it's a, maybe some kind of game playing right. uh, on, on the part of, of, of Bruegel. It, it's, one, it's certainly one of those, those um, paintings, like you were talking about, that it rewards the careful viewer. Correct. The more you look at it, the more drama you get out of it. I mean, it works as a landscape. Right. It's a nice painting. It is beautiful. The colors, the the teals and other kinds of greens of the the sea. There's the nice ship and the full sail. And it's got a, a number of lovely elements. The sheep that are sprinkled across the landscape. Yes. The, um, the orientation of the farmer, the plowman, and he's got a, a red shirt underneath his overgarment which nicely matches the red hat of the uh, angler down on the right-hand side. Right. It's a beautiful painting in and of itself, even without Icarus. Exactly. And the, the, the ship that's just above Icarus, is, that, that's a great ship. It is. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that I like about art, and you know, I'm no art historian, as we, as we mentioned earlier, that's yeah. the caveat, the disclaimer, but I have eyes and I can see things and, and think about them and so forth. So, David, what do you like about a painting? What draws your your eye, your interest to a, a work of art? Well, I like scale, right? So the size of the painting is often very impressive. Some of the galleries I've been to in Europe, places like that, I'm just stunned at the, the scope and the scale of some of these paintings because I've only ever seen them uh, prior to that experience online, some tiny little image. Right. So the notion that a painter, you know, was suspended over this painting uh, with brush and, and palette and so forth suspended on ropes and such in order to paint this massive sort of thing. That's impressive. So bigger is better. Well, oftentimes, yeah. the scale is overwhelming. Okay. Uh, yeah. Colors, that, that's really interesting to me, the, the use of color. 
the composition of the painting, the kinds of things that are put together. And this is why Bruegel is interesting to me here, because as we've said, you can enjoy this painting with no knowledge of Icarus, and you might even miss his flailing legs there in the lower right-hand corner. Right, so there's, there's these layers of, of meaning. Correct. Right, and, and the reward to the careful viewer, right? Now, this is not a huge painting. It's uh, 29 by 44 inches. And would oh. that, does that take away from your enjoyment? A it? little bit. A little I bit. guess Bruegel wasn't hanging over this. No, but. no, no, no. He just he had it on an easel somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. What do you like about the painting? What appeals to you? Um, it, uh, right along those same kinds of lines. I, rem- I remember the first time my attention was drawn to this painting, I, I just found the kicking legs of Icarus so tragic. And the, the fact that it's, he's being ignored or, or missed there, is, it's, it's sad. It's and I and uh, the fact that he's dying alone out there while kind of life goes on. Right, I thought was a really fascinating take on the story. That's a key element and one one that I have heard others speak about as well. So why do you think Bruegel uh, subverts the scene? Why does he change things so much? In the research that I did, um, it seems like the there's a general agreement that kind of the message of the painting, such as it is, is that life is not mythic, hmm. um, and when tragedy happens, life goes on. So when we say it's it's not mythic, well, what do you mean by well, that? I, I think like, like the, the vast majority of one's life is not made up of kind of mythic grand events. It's mundane. It's things. mundane, and so when Ovid says, you know, the world stopped when it, these these guys saw Daedalus Nick or something, this guy thought they were gods. Right. There's like this spotlight in this mythic moment. Right. And Bruegel seems to be saying that's, that's not false. Life. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, as it, I think about my life, you know, I wake up in the morning, I get coffee, and so forth. These kinds of daily, quotidian, mundane rituals. They really define your life. They do. There are some epic moments, right? Yeah. You get married, birth of your first child, birth of every other child, right? But these are these are small events. Well, they're, they're big events, but they're, they're kind of small spikes on the graph. They are. Right. Yeah. Death of loved ones, you know, change of job, change of address. These are significant moments, but they're really, really isolated and intermittent. Right. So Bruegel seems to be, or many people take him to be commenting on kind of how life the vast majority of life really is. Hmm. So I stumbled across, there's a, a, apparently there was, there was, there is a Flemish proverb. I'm sure it sounds better in Flemish. You can't get enough Flemish proverbs. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Could we say that the Flemish proverbs get stuck in one's throat? It, oh, oh, that's Bruegel. That's it. <laughs> but the proverb is uh, something along the lines, and the farmer continued to plow, which is like, Say la vie, life goes on. Yeah. Right. So this this thing happened. Well, the farmer kept on plowing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating because often I find what makes those epic moments in one's life tolerable, um, because sometimes they're not all joy, right? They're, right. They're not all your wedding day. Sometimes they're they are very disturbing, is that we have all these little rituals that continue on in those moments. As when we talked about casseroles at a funeral, right? Yes. yes. Why, why do people eat at a funeral? Right. The, In this country, at least, it's not because we need any more food. No. There's no. something ritualistic about the, the wake. The, That's right. Yeah. There has to be uh, these kinds of small elements in our lives to keep the rest of it going. They, right. They kind of lubricate the epic moments. Right. Exactly right. And and um, like you talk about just like making coffee and, and getting coffee in the morning, I think one of the tricks is, is finding joy. Right. In these small little things. Right. And not saying this is a mundane thing I have to get past so I can get to the to the epic. Right. That's not how life works. No, there's no contentment in that. No. Do you think Bruegel is saying something darker even? Because the death of this young man, Icarus, this is miserable, right? It is miserable. And his father flying overhead, this is an epic moment for his father. His father, right. And which makes it so interesting is that in this version, he erases Daedalus from the scene. Yes. Right? And I mean, there's some Although dif- you said the, the 20th century rediscovery has Daedalus in the scene. Right. And it, there's, there's debate about kind of which version came first. Um, but many art historians, as I take it, believe that this version of the painting that we're looking at without Daedalus was thought to be Bruegel's kind of improvement on it. Mm. And that by removing Daedalus from the scene, he changes the tone. He changes the message, right? And something that makes it kind of more deeply tragic. You know, mm. He's almost suggesting that his father missed it. Oh, really? And his father's flying off somewhere and doesn't realize. Really? So, I mean, possibly. I mean, that's, that's, reading, that's reading more deeply into it than what we see in the painting. But I like that. Uh, do, I like that darkness to it. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think that this is also part of... Bruegel's posture as the northern branch of the Renaissance in art, as opposed to the southern Italian Renaissance, some of the beautiful things we've talked about, 
uh, you know, the, the paintings of Da Vinci and, and Raphael and so forth, in that um, he's making a statement that the mythic elements of life are not just periodic, they're not even significant. I don't know if I would go that far. Okay. But I, I mean, there's something to that. I think, I wonder if geography and climate had a lot to do with this. You know, <laughs> it's easy to kind of look at the world through a mythic lens when you're in the, the sun kissed Mediterranean. Yeah. But here he's up in Belgium. Give me another glass of wine, some more prosciutto and so forth. That's exactly right. But when you're slogging through three feet of snow. Right. Exactly right. Maybe he painted this like in the dead heart of February. Right. right? Where, I um, mean, Northern Europe is no. There's no, there's, no, there's no picnic. Uh, February makes me shiver with, with every paper I deliver. But that's a, uh, a Don McLean, right? Yeah, uh, bad news on the doorstep. Yes, I couldn't take one more step. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that this is true if you, if you look at a lot of Northern Renaissance art. There's a much kind of darker comedy. There's a much more, I think, kind of a, a bleak outlook on life um, to some degree. Um, and I mean, the fact that this is the only painting of Bruegel where he engaged in a mythic subject matter. And what did he choose to do with it? He took this very bleak, kind of dark take on it. Yeah. So, so what is the message of Ovid's tale, do you think? I t- my main takeaway is that it's a, it's a message about hubris. Um, I think a lot of Greek myths, Ovidian myths, have kind of this, be careful what you wish for, you might, just might get it kind right. of quality. So we, we sympathize with Daedalus wanting to escape the island with his son, but this idea that that act of heroism, the act of, of um, you know, parental love, comes with this deep, deep cost. Yeah. Right? It's, it's why, you know, so many, most of the Greek hero stories end so badly. Right. There's very few happily ever afters. That, I take that to be the main message. Another way of looking at this, though, is through the lens of Greek tragedy. And uh, when I teach Greek tragedy, I like to quote Aristotle, you know, from the Poetics. Yes. Where, where he says that uh, tragedy shows people as better than they are in real life. And it doesn't mean morally better. It means that they are larger and grander. They're on a bigger scale, ah. which is why in Greek tragedy, every character is a descendant of the gods. Yes. You, yes. Can't, you can't be in a tragedy unless you have uh, a divine ancestor at some point. Comedy, on the other hand, shows people as worse than they are in real life. Hmm. You know, more low, more cruel, more vicious. All of their qualities and faults are exaggerated yeah. in some way. And so we could look at this painting as anti-tragic, right? Yeah. So we'll just let people like Icarus and Daedalus and those mythic stories, they can go their own way. But real life is centered around mundane things, yes. turning your back, going on in the plow, yeah. with the plow in the furrow. Exactly right. Yeah. Are there other elements we should talk about in the painting? I think so. I mean, there's some interesting things here that um, are in the painting that aren't necessarily Ovidian, things that, um, that, that Bruegel adds in. My favorite is the mysterious kind of thing in the, kind of in the dark patch on the center left of the painting which the plowman seems to be kind of circling from or circling towards. It's a, it seems to be a, kind of an upturned head uh, there in the bushes. And that's... Ca- that's that's no really lo- hard to spot. Is that located below the horse? It's right above the horse or the donkey's head there. If you go straight up from the donkey's head, okay. you see that little kind of that white splotch? Right. That's a, it's, if you zoom in on that, it's an upturned face. I thought that was the ad nauseum logo. <laughs> exactly. We, we could plug that in. I okay. like that. Yeah. Um, so we, we've a, just defaced great art now. We, we have. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's unforgivable. But it's a, it's a head of a, of a dead guy. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe a fat guy who was eaten. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or a skull. Um, I also was reading that there's a, um, it was a recent spectral analysis of the painting. And it looks like whoever painted this uh, depicted a, a guy defecating back there. Really? Yes. In the bushes? Yes, back there. That sounds like Bruegel. It does sound like Bruegel. Uh, right. If I'm not mistaken, his contemporaries called him, and here's my attempt to you know, translate some Dutch, Per den Droll. Which means? Uh, Peter the Turd. Peter the Turd. <laughs> and they called him that because all of his characters were so hideous. Oh my, yeah, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, and he knew it, and that's what he was aiming for. Well, perfect. So that would be perfect. I don't, he, but whoever painted this edited it out. So didn't want to keep the I guess not the guy defecating. Did you ever? Did you have a nickname growing up? I'm sorry. Did you have a nickname growing up? <laughs> I had many, but we're not going to talk about them on the you air. You're not going to talk to me. Tell me a kind no. of no, okay. no. I thought that'd be a good. That's for episode twenty nine. Twenty nine. Okay, I'll make a note of that. All right. So the, the question: What is? I mean, what is? What does that mean? What's What's the creepy head doing back there? Is it? Is it uh, again? It just maybe just adds to kind of another tragic layer. Is it a memento mori? Me- yes. Remember right? death. This is what this is what awaits us all. Yeah. I've also read somebody noting that the the angle of the plowman's head is similar to the angle of the donkey. 
Hmm. Is there any real difference? Futility of life. Futility of life. Going in a circle and you're, you're just going to wind up at the head in the bushes. There. Right. So unburied, unmourned, unloved, unsung. Right. Mm. Virgil has this phrase. I just was looking at it yesterday. Uh, Curvus Arator, the bent-backed plowman. Yeah. It's from uh, Eclogue 3, I think. Oh, yeah. That's it, very much this guy right Yeah, here. absolutely. Because, right. you know, you, you just pull behind the plow forever. You end up being like the animal pulling it. Yes. I also read some other analysis that, I mean, the plowman isn't really dressed like a plowman. He's kind of dressed fancily. Right. And if you look off to the uh, to the left, kind of just below the donkey, he's left kind of a pouch and a dagger behind or off to the side. And what could that mean? Could it be that he's kind of abandoned the mythic, right? He's abandoned his, his sword. He's abandoned kind of the life of, of heroism. And he's kind of embraced this life of the mundane. I don't know. That's fascinating. That's are really there some, interesting. Are there some time problems in the painting as well? Yes. I, we were talking about this earlier. Right. As art will often do when it embraces a myth, I think it tries to tell lots of elements of the story at once. Many have noted that the sun is setting uh, in this painting. In the other version where Daedalus is in the sky, it looks to be high noon, which would make more sense for you know the sun at its brightest, at its hottest. That's when Icarus falls. But here the sun is setting. We're towards the end of the day. Right. And so, again, what does that mean? The sun sets, it's setting on Icarus's life. Yeah. It's a more metaphorical kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it is, it's not a direct telling of the story. Yeah, this is the joy of art. It's suggestive, evocative. It's not, it doesn't really dictate what you are to think. Exactly right. It leaves an open canvas. So, and this painting just invites so many different responses to it. It's, mm. it, it's, it's wonderful. Now, in the original story, at Icarus's death, Nearby was the Perdix, yes. the partridge. So this character was a first cousin of Icarus, the nephew of Daedalus. That's right. If I'm not mistaken, the inventor of the saw. Yes. He saw the, uh, the skeleton of a fish. Yes. How, how the bones are arranged in a series. And he invented the saw. Daedalus, from jealousy, picked up Perdix and threw him to his death. As he plunged down, Athena transformed him into the partridge. The partridge, right. So in Ovid's telling, the partridge is there in a tree nearby, mocking, cackling at the death of Icarus. Right. Because now Icarus has died just like he has. Yes, adding just a deep insult to deep injury. Correct. Right. There is a partridge in this scene. Okay. Right? And again, if you look up just to the uh, up and to the left of the angler, uh, there you see him. Uh, they're yep, perching there a tree. Is. I don't think it's a pear tree. Definitely a partridge there. It's, it's a barren tree. It's a barren tree. And, I mean, it's hard to tell that, I mean, the, the partridge seems to be interested in the same thing that the angler is interested in. Are you expert at reading partridge emotions? I minored in it. Yeah, did you? <laughs> You're part of the partridge family, you might say. Exactly right. Well, drove around in a bus and playing crappy music. and It's hard to tell what the bird's looking at, um, but he also seems to be kind of missing the scene. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what to make of that. No. I mean, it, I think it's a clear nod towards Ovid again. Um, Bruegel is kind of showing off his knowledge to some degree, but the partridge is not doing what it does in the story. Hmm. So I hear we have a, a kind of a closing quote or a not our gustatory parting shot. You'll have to stand by for that soon. But we have something from uh, W.H. Auden, his poem. Yeah. Can you read us a little bit of that? Because I think it's quite insightful for understanding this painting. Sure. Right. So uh, Auden wrote this poem. It purported to be kind of a response to his visit to this museum where he saw the painting. And I'll read the lines that have to do with the, the, the painting. This was uh, from 1938. Is 1938, that right? It's got yes. It's got another French title, Jeff. Musée des Belles Arts. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the last few lines uh, here. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him... It was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water in the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Oh, that's really powerful. It's wonderful. Had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Right. So firmly in the camp of missing the tragic. Ignoring the mythic. The, the, the farmer continues to plow. Yeah. Right. Why this is so resonant with my own experience is we live in a time... Uh, not to get too philosophical, but we are just overwhelmed with current events. There's yeah. just so much stuff all the so time. Much noise. Right. How can yeah. you possibly keep up with it? Well, right. you, you can't, right? And so like the fall of Icarus, you want to feel, I mean, I want to feel bad about the tremendous amount of suffering and disorder and injustice in the world. But at some point, it's too much for one person to digest. Right. You get that kind of that tragedy fatigue. That's right. Right. That, I think that fits really nicely with kind of what this painting is, is trying to say. Yeah. 
All right, well, that just about wraps up this episode. We want to remind listeners, please send us your thoughts and comments, your suggestions, as some have done. Uh, write to Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget there's a V in there. Or Dave at adnauseum.com. And Jeff, you got us our gustatory parting shot to take us out. Is that right? I do. I have a context-free quote from George Bernard Shaw, who once wrote or said, the thought of 2,000 people crunching celery at the same time horrified <laughs> me. Great stuff. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.